It's another Spike Studio production. Welcome, everybody, for this edition of Consulting Your Pocket webcast. This time we have Lotus Protector for Mail Security with Victor Toll. This one's brought to you by Connectria. Eat, sleep, host. It's what we do. They are your premier Lotus hosting and managed service provider there is. Look them up, www.connectria.com, and look at their new plans as they just announced a whole bunch of things, including managed hosting, complex hosting, self-service hosting, everything you need. Once again, connectria.com for all your Lotus hosting needs. Welcome, everybody. Hopefully, we are on time within a minute here looking at it. It is another Consultant in Your Pocket webcast. This time, actually a great topic, something I'm familiar with that we're going to get a lot of good information from. Love this product itself. Lotus Protector for Mail Security. Lotus has released the Lotus Protector suite of tools, including Protector for Mail Security, which is today's topic. Also, the Mail Encryption product came out as well. We're going to have to do a whole separate webcast on that. It's a very cool in-depth product on encryption about your environment. So the normal, we have Victor Toll with us today and a couple brief things about consulting your pocket and then off we go with Victor. And if I can click in the right place today, we'll be even better. You guys know as usual, raise your hands as we go along, ask any questions you need, I'll feed them over uh, to Victor. We'll try to get them answered on the side in the chat. If you have any problems with audio or video, please let us know. Raise your hand, make a comment, anything you need to do. Both the chat and the questions will be watched as we go along. A couple things for you. Some white papers have been starting to be released. Uh, if you are a member of the newsletter for I Do Notes, the first one came out on dynamic client configuration, uh, the history of it, functionality, troubleshooting. So a whole list of white papers are coming out. So if you don't subscribe to any of my, I suggest you subscribe to that and to this one as a newsletter. I tell you up front about upcoming webcasts upcoming launches, anything before everybody else knows. I don't blog about it usually first. It always goes at everybody on the newsletters first. So the DCC one is there. There's another one coming on replication topology as well. And lastly, uh, sponsoring us today, connect to ourselves. Not only do we use Lotus Protector, but uh, we actually host Lotus Protector. So we're an edge service for a lot of companies that want to use the Lotus product suite, but keep the spam off their networks we become their edge network. So basically fire up Lotus Protector appliances, connect to their networks and their domino infrastructures for them, and take care of it. Our new slogan just got launched a week and a half ago, Eat, Sleep, Host. It's what we know, it's what we do. Uh, but we actually just merged our managed services and our uh, complex hosting services together two weeks ago, and we're glad to have Connectory sponsor this one, as well as we personally run this product. So not only do we have familiarity with it, uh, we love it. So a uh, couple things as we go along with it. So, Victor, are you there hanging out? Uh, yes, I'm here. You're a little quiet all of a sudden, but you're there. Uh, yes, I'm here. I, there I'm you go. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. All right, so what I'm going to do, everybody, is change controls over to Victor, let him run through uh, the presentation itself. As usual, it is being recorded for later playback. As usual, uh, we will have the slides available for those. Uh, if you have questions, like I said, put them on the side. Uh, anything you need in the chats. We will get to you and make sure we at least get an answer or get someone that knows about it. So hang on one second. I'll give him controls. Show my screen. All right. I hope everyone can see this. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Toll. I'm going to be uh, co-hosting with uh, Chris today. And we're talking about Lotus Protector for Mail Security. As uh, Chris has alluded before, it's a uh, Really interesting product. Uh, Lotus started it a couple of years ago when they bought a company, which name now, of course, eludes me when I'm supposed to talk about it. Um, and uh, initially, basically, I really didn't look at it. I really started looking at it about two years ago when they came into version two. And uh, I've been actually running it myself ever since. It's very simple. One of the reasons I like it so much is that you can run it either as a full appliance, it means you're installing it on hardware, or you can also just download the VMware image and run it on any VMware infrastructure that you might have, which I think is really, I like the word cool a lot, but I really think that's very cool because it makes it easy for larger or smaller environments to run it. Um, as Chris alluded before, you're going to be able to get the slideshow um, afterwards. It's a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, there's a lot of slides in it, altogether over 50, and don't worry, I'm not going to go through each and every one of them in great detail. Um, I have them more or less for screen prints, so when you go through it, you can say, oh, that's where you set it, oh, this is where I find it. It's more of a guide for there, and uh, so here we go. What are we going to talk about today first? Um, first of all, a little bit about what Lotus Protector, what's it made of, 
afterwards, I'll talk a little bit about the architecture. Where can you fit it into your environment? What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? What options might you have? Then I'm going to go into how you set it up and how you do just some basic configuration. Then what I like most is backup and restore, just because most people never really try that out and until it's too late. Uh, then instead of going into a very deep dive of what you can configure on it, because that would be very different for each individual information uh, environment, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how you would set up clustering, because I think that most environments would want to cluster at least one or two of them so they have redundancy. And then the part that I like the most is how does Lotus Protector actually interact with your Domino user, with the Domino client. So those are the six topics we're going to be concentrating on, and uh, here we go. So what is it? Let me just hide a panel so I can see something myself. Uh, Lotus Protector is um, a single device that will take care of spam, content filtering. Uh, it can work your inbound, your outbound mail. That means you can route your outbound mail through it as well and run policies against it. Uh, you might see on that little kanji thing here on the side, it even works with double byte character sets, which I find really interesting, especially since I do a lot of different uh, um, languages in the environment that I work with. There we go, next one. Uh, it also works, as I mentioned before, directly with the Domino client. It interacts with it. It gives the end user the actual um, ability to look at what are my personal whitelists, which means what am I allowing to come through, even if the device itself would say, no, it's not allowed. What are my blacklists, which means what am I denying to come to me, even though um, the appliance might let it through. Um, what kind of spam reports are there for me? That means what has the appliance done for me lately? And if there's any uh, mail that's held, that means it needs someone to look at it. It'll, hold, it'll give you a report on that as well, and then you can decide if you actually want it or not. I have been clamoring with many um, antivirus and spam appliance creators over the last 10 years, and this was always something I've been looking for, because I like giving the, the end user the ability to do that. And this is the first time it's really built in directly into the dominant client. I don't think anyone else has this. Uh, currently, Protector is version 2.6. That's the latest version. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can run it on hardware or you can run it as a VM. You can download the VM and just load it onto any kind of uh, infrastructure you have. Uh, the background of it is actually a uh, SUV Linux that's running. And uh, you can cluster. And the nice thing is you can cluster between devices. That means even if you run part of your environment as a VM and part of the hardware, you can still cluster them among each other. They do not care. How do you get it? Uh, it's a download. And initially, everything is free. We all like the word free, free, free. For 90 days, you can run the full version. Um, and, it and it will update its antivirus, its spam, uh, its phishing um, modules. Everything will update itself for 90 days without a problem. And you can run it in your environment, anywhere. You can cluster it. You can do whatever you want. It will run. And it will do everything you need to do. And I can guarantee you, once you've set it up, you will forget it's even there. And uh, then if after 90 days, it will still run. The thing it doesn't do anymore, it does not update its antivirus and uh, anti-spam modules, but it will still run. Uh, all you have to do then is get yourself a license key, enter it, and then there you go again, and uh, it'll start updating itself and keep on running. You don't have to do a rip and replace any time. That's, that's one of the things I really like. So here's a little bit about the background in VMware. You can run it on a server. You can run it on a VMware workstation, which is actually why I've been testing it initially, a uh, player or an ESX server. Um, and on hardware right now, some of you might have been looking at some of the uh, blog posts that have been going out. I know Chris did several of them. It's only really certified to run on IBM hardware currently, so you can run it on other. Uh, there's some problems with the install module right now that uh, when it's looking for a CD-ROM player, the way that different hardware um, uh, makers define their their um, CD-ROM um, or their uh, their DVD player that the installer can't find it. So it doesn't mean it wouldn't run. There's ways around it, but I'm not going to go into those details there. You can see down here. Oops. Sorry. Down here is a nice little link to give you the detailed requirements if you want to look at them later. I just um, I distill them down to what's a little bit more um, pertinent to us. Okay. This is where we get a little bit into the architecture. Where can you fit a Lotus protector into your environment? I'm pretty sure that most of you, either you're running it yourself or some of your colleagues are running it, have some kind of antivirus or anti-spam device that's sitting somewhere outside 
of your environment next to maybe also running um, antivirus and anti-spam directly in your dominant environment. Um, this is a device that you put out on the edge. So uh, you put it like directly behind your outside firewall. That's where it fits. Um, yeah, on the right you have the, the BBI, which I like to call the big bad internet. That's where all the evil stuff comes from. Um, it, 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 all you do is you set up that your MX records, where someone wants to send you email, that it goes through your firewall, then directly to your um, notice protector. It will then just pick up all the email and start working on it and send it on to your internal network after it's uh, looked at all the email, see if it's good or bad, hold it, delete it, clean it, whichever one. Uh, alternatively, like I mentioned before, you can also then set it up that the mail goes from your internal mail infrastructure outside either to the internet, so you can relay your own mail through it to the internet, or alternatively, you might have other um, environments where you send SMTP mail to that doesn't necessarily go through the internet. You could set your protector up to do that too with, um, with separate policies. Here's another option. This would be, for instance, a nicer option for a cluster environment. You have two. Uh, your firewall, um, either your firewall is set to uh, um, spray the incoming SMTP traffic for you, or possibly have um, your MX records are set up with multiple um, uh, with multiple MX um, settings um, that have both of your protectors, three or four or five, however many you want, and uh, then the incoming mail will get sprayed through it, and then handed on to your internal um, mail infrastructure. This is a this is what I see a lot in client places. They'll have usually two. One is never enough. Um, two is, is common. Sometimes, depending on the environment, on the size, and how much mail um, that a client will be dealing with, there might be more than two because you want to make sure that even in case of a failure or if you have to take something down, that you have enough capacity to run through um, your normal mail volume per day. This is where I had one client that went crazy. They had a redundant site. They had some, um, uh, they had some cluster in one site several clusters on another site. They ran everything for MX records and uh, actually ran very well, I must say. It was, uh, it was a little bit challenging to get it to work with the notes coin. I'll go into that a little bit later. But this is also an option that you might have. OK. We're going to go now a little bit about the installation. So um, as you can see, what, you, what kind of information are you going to need to prepare ahead of time to do a very quick and a very simple installation of Lotus Protector. And I mean it's quick. It shouldn't take you longer than 30, maybe 40 minutes, depending on how fast um, the device is that you install it on. But um, what the one thing that I like to set ahead of time is what passwords are going to be used. And the reason for that is that when you're in the middle of setting things up and you have those little bits and pieces of paper sitting around, and you scribble on top of that what password you're going to input now for the new admin account on the Blows Protector that usually gets lost somewhere in the process. So I like to set that ahead of time. And this is not the password I use. If you try to hack my account, that's not going to work. What, is, what do you need? OK, you need information on your network. Um, are you going to be using static IP addresses, or are you going to be using DHCP? Um, what's your DNS settings for uh, your internal network? then uh, you're going to need DNS entries for the protector box, depending on what you're going to be setting for the IP address, because you're going to want to use that. You need that later on for your uh, um, <clears throat> for other devices to possibly relay information through your protector or for and also for your uh, dominant client to then connect to that protector box. You're going to need to know um, other devices are allowed to relay SMTP through this um, through your protector. You might have other devices or servers that do that. Uh, you need to know all the IP addresses and, ho and or host names of your internal mail servers. Uh, are you using any MX records, internal and external, where they set to? And uh, if you, you have your own SSL certificates, you can use them on the protector box um, for access. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. These are some of the ports you're going to need uh, externally, 25 and 443. Internally, a little bit more than that. Um, port 25, 443, um, 389 for LDAP. It could be another port. Incidentally, uh, my ports are set to something else. Uh, you also might need the uh, MTP port because the one thing when you have, especially multiple protector boxes, is that they all have to have the identical time. Otherwise, uh, when you have multiple boxes that are clustered, your users might see some very interesting things with at what time did um, protector save me from this virus or not. And it, it can turn really ugly. So 
um, then you need you know, the other ports are mainly for internal clustering and for the services, the cluster servers to talk to each other. Another brief word about uh, VMware versus physical. Um, they're virtually the same. The only difference is uh, that on a physical box, of course, you have an ISO that you're going to download from uh, IBM sites. You're going to probably burn it on a DVD and flip it into a uh, uh, into the uh, server you're installing it in. And with uh, the VMware, you're just going to download the VMware image and throw it onto whichever maybe in the FX box. And that's really the only difference. The other one is that uh, the VMware server. Uh, the VMware image has an additional IP address that you can use to um, communicate with any kind of uh, client that might be on your VMware host itself. Uh, if you don't need it, you can just turn it off it, because you're probably not going to need it. Uh, and that's virtually the only difference between them. Everything else is the same. Once you hit the switch or turn on the device in VMware, everything after that is the same. The only diff the only thing that I I'm, I'd like to mention here is because I mentioned passwords before, the uh, the because Protector runs on a version of Linux, there's always also a root account in there, which is the godlike presence in Linux that can do everything. And initially, they both have the same password, which is admin. So when you change them, my suggestion here, and I'm going to point this out several times more, is never to make them the same again, because it just opens up your your device to all kind of tomfoolery by other people. So this is oops. This is going to be the first screen you see once you power up your uh, uh, your device either in VMware or or on a physical device. And this screen here will flash for about 15, 20 seconds, maybe 30. Uh, and if you just leave it alone, it's going to go through the initial setup. And I'll go through what these other settings here are briefly later. And from there on, it's just Linux running and doing self-configuration. It, it takes, depending on the speed of your device, it can take anywhere from two to three minutes to four or five. Uh, I, I usually don't even go for coffee in between because it's very fast. This, on the console, is going to be the screen that you then see. And uh, this is where you can do some initial settings if you want. Or you can directly from here with the information as you can see here, it will report what its main um, IP address came up with. If you have DHCP turned on in your environment and it's free and you do not have reservations or closed down who can get something, it will it is initially set up to get its first IP address over DHCP and it will report up here on the right hand corner where you see it with a little red arrow. It's going to report what IP address it got. And if you want, you can then um, take a browser and go HTTPS, this IP address, and go to the interface and start configuring it. Or you can do a first initial configuration from here. You can see down here it's going to say um, your login. You say admin, to password, and you can go in and do some configuration. What you're allowed to do is it's going to tell you some more about the what IP addresses there are, and you can change the passwords. Uh, you will be able to change, and you actually have to change both the root password and the admin account password. Again, they both are initially the same, and please change them to something else. Uh, then you can set the IP address for uh, the interface and say, do you want it to be DHCP, or possibly do you want it to be a specific IP address that you've already reserved internally. Um, and from there on, what you do is you connect with the browser. And you go, uh, what's going to happen is when you go HTTPS, IP address of the device, it's first going to come up with a, uh, depending on which browser you use, if you see on the right here, that's Firefox telling me that it doesn't know the, uh, the SSL certificate and do you really want to trust it. Uh, and if you use IE, it's going to be one of those, oh, do you really want to go to this website, yes or no, you just say yes. And you're going to get this first initial welcome page. Um, and if you want later on, you can actually replace the SSL certificate. I put the uh, documentation on where to do that here in the, in the slide so they can find it more easily. And this is where you then start the actual basic configuration of uh, Lotus Protector. It, if I've counted right, from the time that, I, that we would have switched on the power till right now, we're probably about five minutes. So we might even have been faster if I hadn't been talking. We'd already be right here starting to configure this device. 
the first two slides are just really you're, you're signing away your firstborn or any other children that you don't need and agreeing to everything that IBM tells you. Uh, then you go on to the next page, which will uh, then take you and ask you, do you want to do this manually or do you want to use the wizard? Uh, the, the assistant, I personally always prefer to run the assistant first. It's just faster that way and makes it much easier. Uh, though if this is your 15th one that you're setting up, you can just say skip the assistant and go manually and then do everything by yourself if you want to. Um, this is where you can say do we have a license or no? Are you going to use the free 90 day trial license? Uh, then the next page will take you to the passwords. If you haven't already changed them in uh, in the console before, you can change them here. It shows you how to do that. You input the current one, the new one, it asks you twice, and then you say yes, and it's going to take that. It won't actually change these passwords to the very end when you're done. Otherwise, it wouldn't validate your current um, web session. Next part that comes is your network configuration. If you don't want to change anything because you like the IP addresses, there's nothing here to do. Uh, otherwise, you can just say configure network, and then you get this extra. There's a little if you see it here, sometimes I, and initially I always found it hard to see. There's little um, URL links here. Um, configure the network, and then it gives you the uh, the possibility to change the, um, the host name. And if you want to configure the uh, IP addresses, I have it set up that it uses DHCP because in my environment I always use DHCP reservations. That's just how I like to work. Next part goes to the SMTP options. Like I said, the, the wizard, the assistant will take you through everything. And you can always just say if you want. You don't have to set anything here. If you don't want to, you can just go through, say yes, yes, yes to everything, and then configure it later. Uh, you can do that if you want to get familiar with it. I would suggest, though, to change the default password in any case. Uh, this is where you can input some of the uh, details about your uh, SMTP environment, um, what's your local domain, um, what do you want your protector to uh, um, to answer as to the internet? Because you're going to have to have uh, probably um, PTR records on the internet that will say what the, what the name is, so that you don't get rejected later. And if you want to uh, use DNA, um, just standard DNS or other forwarding servers for email that's going out, here's some more detailed settings. If you what are the for um, alerts, um, internal um, relay hosts, if you have any or not. Uh, what addresses do you want different alerts to come through as it's pretty straightforward. And this is then actually where you set up uh, the actual alerts. And what I really like here in, uh, is that you have the possibility to subscribe to an, to an event log. That means you can do, if you have an RSS reader in the company that you read with and you maybe have a possibility outside, it will give it to you as a feed. And I really like this because one of the first things I do in the morning is I usually go to my uh, I usually go to uh, uh, my uh, reader in the morning, and I'll look at blog posts, go through uh, you know new tech notes and things, and if I could add the uh, RSS feed for my protector environment in there, which at when I'm at home I have, uh, it'll tell me if there's anything going on. I can go through the messages real quick, and I know what's going on. And I, I like this feature a lot. I must admit. The next screen that'll take you to once you click next is uh, the time setting. By default, it'll take you to the government uh, um, network internet time server. You can change it to an internal one if you like to. That's up to you. Sorry, there we go. Uh, and then in the end, you're basically done. It's going to say, do you really want to do this, yes or no? You click uh, Finish. And then it's going to start applying the configuration that you've just said, including all the passwords. If you've changed the password, what's going to happen is uh, it's going to invalidate your session. You have to actually close your browser and reopen it and go back to the initial URL. This is where you say start a new session. You're done. That's the last screen you're going to see. So from beginning to now, I'd say we've probably spent anywhere from five to ten minutes, not counting whatever preparation time you might have done with gathering information or pre-setting um, DNS settings, MX records, or things like that. So right now, if you want to do nothing else, your, your protector is almost finished and ready to go to start relaying mail. It's this fast if you want to do it. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about 
what you do after your first initial setup. Again, you're going to go in with your browser. You're going to connect one more time. You're hopefully you've changed the password to something else that's very complicated and not easy to remember. And the first thing I like to suggest to anyone is that um, when you download the protector, um, it comes with very old relatively old um, antivirus and anti-spam settings. And the first thing I would suggest is before you do anything else, before you let anything go through, any test mail, whatever it might be, go to updates and update everything. This, unfortunately, is going to take some time. Uh, the first update, because it's going to download the whole database once, uh, it can take anywhere from I've had it as fast as 25, 30 minutes, and on another server it took me literally an hour and a half. Depending on speed, uh, your connection to the internet, it can be a little, if you're lucky, it will be done in 30 minutes, and you'll have peace of mind. I really don't suggest to start doing anything without downloading first. Unless you know it's in a test environment, no live man will go through, you don't care, then go ahead. Otherwise, first step, update, and then you don't have to worry about anything. Now, after you've updated, this is when I start working on a, on a device and actually say, well, what can I do? Is it really forwarding mail correctly? Is it receiving mail from the internet? What's going on? And I don't, didn't want to go through all those details because it's pretty tedious and there's a lot of screenshots. Uh, the, the Lotus Protector um, Getting Started documentation has a very good guide on what to do. Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to set up a client to relay its SMTP mail to the protector. You're going to configure Protector to allow the IP address of your client to actually relay through it. You're going to send an email to an internal account and then to an external account on the internet. You're going to make sure they go through. There are some test policies on the Protector that you can turn on. It'll go and look at, there's like a subject line in there, um, a specific one, do something to it, like append a message to it. And you're going to check if that's working. And if that works, then your Protector right now is ready to go and you can already start having email go through it. Uh, the exact documentation, what to do, is here. This little URL will take you to that document and actually tell you where you can then look up exactly what you need to do. But it is this fast. And from start to finish right now, including the update of the, uh, of the databases, we're probably at somewhere around an hour to an hour and a half from beginning. So after about an hour and a half, maybe two hours, of setup time, of which in between you have quite a coffee break when it's downloading the databases, you're ready to go and you have a new, ready, finished Lotus Protector device running in your environment, ready to take over the um, your mail flow. What other things can you now, once you've done everything, start thinking about the setting? Um, you can set some advanced SMTP um, settings. Do you want all your email to go to one place? Are you maybe hosting um, SMTP mail for multiple SMTP domains? Uh, you have to set all of them so it recognizes them. Um, if you get mail, for instance, for Acme.com and Acme.net, you're going to have to tell Protector that it's also supposed to take mail for Acme.net, not just Acme.com. Um, do you want to use TLS, which is uh, Transport Layer Security, it used to be called SSL. Do you want to use it, yes or no? Uh, in which case, you're going to have to install um, uh, SSL certificate. Do you want some extra spam or virus settings, yes or no? Any specific mail policy rules do you want to set? As most of you probably already have devices, you probably have some specific rules there. You're going to have to sit down and, and start thinking how you translate them best into the Lotus Protector device. Um, LDAP, do you want uh, your device to actually be able to look up internal mail addresses and say, yes, this, this is an address I'm going to accept mail for it, or no? It also needs to be able to access an internal LDAP source so that you can uh, have your Lotus, your users and their Lotus Notes clients interact with it. Um, mail storage and quarantine settings, how long is it going to keep mail? These are all things that um, you're probably not going to know initially until you haven't set it up and played with it, but these are additional settings that you can set, and I would uh, suggest that you take some time with it. And uh, one of the things while you're playing with it is backups. The nice thing about um, uh, Lotus Protector is it's got a, a nice backup feature. You can back up either the whole system or just back up uh, specific configuration snapshots. Uh, if you're running in VMware, you can also just do a uh, VMware snapshot, which I find very um, helpful at times. What's the difference between a system backup and a configuration snapshot? It's pretty simple. System backup backups everything. 
Uh, you can only have one system backup configured at any time. The initial one that comes with the device is, is basically the initial installation. If for some reason you started making all kinds of configuration settings and you can make no, neither heads nor tails of it and you don't know what you set and uh, you're having trouble, you can go back to your initial system backup. It will take it back to a virgin state, which is basically that one state right after you um, push the power button for the first time. You can replace that if you've gone through this configuration here successfully, you've tested it, you know it works. You can make a new system backup and then that is your default backup to which you can go back to where it resets everything. Configuration snapshots are a smaller subset. Um, that'll have things like your policy settings, um, any kind of uh, special routing settings, FNTP settings, stuff like that. Um, but it doesn't include things such as the basic configuration of the device, like username and passwords and things like that. You can have as many configuration snapshots as you like. Uh, you can save them locally in the device. You can download them um, over HTTP. So you can save them off of the device. So in case the device itself breaks, you don't lose them. Uh, that's very convenient. And I would suggest that the first thing you do is, if you've, if you've actually been successful doing your testing, I would make frequent backups just so you can go back to different steps in time. And again, that's very simple. I like it. This device is very simple. You go to, you go to a, um, a page, it tells you exactly what to do. Uh, if you go to um, um, Backup and Restore, it's very simple. It will tell you do you want to make um, configuration backups or do you want to make a system backup. Again, system backup is everything. Configuration backups are smaller subsets. Uh, then you just you go in there, you say new, you give it a name, click on it, and it takes over from there. If you're making a system backup, however, what's going to happen is um, because it has to make a full snapshot of the whole device, it's going to take over the device and make it invalid. You can't work with it because it actually takes um, shuts down the IP address. So your device will not be functional during this time. So I would not take a system backup. I don't know, like 8 o'clock in the morning when this is your only protected device around because it's not going to be able to accept any inbound mail. And this can take, depending on your configuration, anywhere from 5, 10, 15 minutes, probably closer between 5 and 10. And uh, after it's done, it's going to start itself back up again and be available with all of this configuration. Now you have a fully configured system you can go back to in case you royally screw up at one time or someone else because it probably won't be you. It's always someone else's fault. This is where we now start to talk a little bit more about the other two features I mentioned before. Um, one is clustering. And then after this, we'll talk about the interaction with the dominant client. Clustering um, is it's slightly different. If you're familiar with how dominant clustering works, this is not dominant clustering. Um, basically, what happens is that um, when you create a cluster, there is one primary device and then everyone else is a slave to that. All of them can do the same functions, but you configure everything, you set everything through the primary device. If you lose that primary device, you're in trouble because things will stop working. Uh, your, your, uh, your spokes, your cluster members will all still work, but you can't change your configuration anymore, so you're going to be in trouble, which means, like I mentioned before, backups, backups, backups. You're going to want to have good system backups of everything and configuration backups, especially when you go into clustering. Because what happens with clustering is, and I'll mention, and this will be mentioned in several afterwards, is that once you add a device to a cluster, it loses all of its own individual configuration because it reads the master configuration from whoever the master, um, the, the master device is. And it's a slave to that one. And if there was something wrong that you needed, you've now lost it, unless you have a backup that you can go back to afterwards. Um, basically what happens is internet mail comes in, any of either the primary device or the cluster members can deal with internal, external mail routing, whatever needs to be done. All of them are equal in that respect, so all of them will do the job, including the central appliance. However, your interaction in terms of configuration and later for your dominant appliance all happens over the central appliance. That's where you actually interact with them not over the other cluster members, because there could be hundreds of those. Um, but it's the central appliance that actually then captures all of the information and presents it to you in terms of reports, 
statistics, and then for the end user on how to interact with their blacklist, mail that's held for them, everything. Again, like I mentioned here, um, if you add a server to a cluster, it loses all of its data. If you the, the first primary server that you add loses all of its data, so there's nothing left behind. It's a fresh slate. So if you're going to add, if you running like a one uh, protector right now, and you think you're going to want to make a cluster, my suggestion is that you either buy new devices or new VMware instances and create your cluster on the side, set it up and do everything, and do not touch the current one. Create a new one, and uh, then start testing that one, and leave your current um, one alone. It's really pretty easy, because you can do everything in VM, and then you can uh, use that setup to then go to a um, hardware setup that you want to. It's a little bit complicated, but that's actually possible. Um, I think I've mentioned this. The cluster members receive the configuration from central appliance. Um, the one thing you have to remember, though, is, and there's actually a warning in there, and one of the screenshots shows it, that when you create the first initial cluster member, which is the central appliance, it's going to ask you to create a passphrase. This passphrase is important because that's what you will need to either add or remove other cluster members to the cluster later. And if you forget it, then there's no way to retrieve it. It's, it's, it's encapsulated in a way that not even IBM can help you out of there. So even if you open up a help desk ticket at, uh, with IBM support, they will not be able to help you. If you forget that, it's gone. So again, keep backups of everything and make sure that you write down every password religiously and keep it off-site so that you don't run into this problem. I actually must admit that I did this initially. I thought I typed one thing. I was pretty sure I did. I wrote it down correctly, but my handwriting was wrong. And uh, luckily, it, it was a test environment I was building, but I had to rebuild them all because I forgot that passphrase. And it's a very painful experience because you've just wasted several hours of your life. These are just some screen prints on how to, um, how to add a uh, cluster. The, the upper screen print is actually the first one you create. It's going gonna, it's gonna to know what you want to do, create a standalone, create a new one. Uh, it's going to ask you for the passphrase. Put it one more time. Again, please make a good note of that passphrase and make it something that's not too difficult to, to recognize for yourself. Um, then it's going to say, do you really want to do that? It will warn you one more time and tell you everything what's going on is you're going to lose all your data. Uh, and if you click OK here, you have just done it, and it's going to start creating a cluster, and you'll see that little screen on the bottom, and we'll go through and give you an update on how far it is. And after that, once you're done, it's going to show you a new tab here in the home uh, on the first landing page you get, which is called Home. There's going to be a new tab called Clustering, where you will be able to see all of, this, um, all of the statistic details of what's going on in the cluster. When I took the screenshot, it was the first one I took uh, the, the initial server, so there's no details in it yet. There wasn't an email going through it. But this is where you'll see, and this is the combined information of all of the uh, um, cluster mates. And then individually, you'll see each individual further down. You can see the little twisty here. You can go back and forth and, and look at all of your cluster mates and see how healthy they are and what they're doing. This is really very painless. Uh, if you're used to setting up clusters in other devices or in other environments, or like a, a dominant cluster, you know, there's usually a lot more thought process that goes through it. This here is probably as painless as it gets. And again, if you take good backups of everything first, so you can go back if you made a mistake, it's, it's very simple to do, I must say. This is really easy. Um, this is the screen of when you uh, add another member. It looks slightly different. It's going to give you a similar um, error and just say, hey, what's going on? You really want to lose everything, go ahead. You're going to say yes, and put that passphrase there. Tell it which IP you want to communicate over, and then off you go. OK, that's, that's clustering. And from here on forward, it's really simple. Your email will come through. Um, all of it, Like I said before, all of your cluster members are capable of dealing with every piece of mail, including the central appliance. And it works. I've set it up where I actually, where, um, I actually had it clustered over a WAN. What's challenging, especially if you have a lot of mail, but it is possible. Um, in places where you might have a, a backup environment or a hot site, I don't suggest it. 
because it gets a little bit difficult. There's a lot of data going back and forth, so I wouldn't really suggest that, especially the, the cluster members that are on a site that might not be able to communicate with their um, with the main device might have trouble later down the road in case of an outage. So I'd suggest creating a secondary um, cluster or maybe just a single instance, but it is possible if you think that that works for you. This is really as painless as it gets. Okay, that's clustering. Now I'm going to go to the, uh, let's see, there's some questions here. Um, and I'm going to go to the last part that I wanted to talk about, which is the interaction with the dominant coin. Uh, let me just hide something on my side. I've mentioned before it was a screenshot that you've seen. Um, this is really unique. There's nothing else at this point in time that will out of the box without you having to so jump through hoops and change templates and, and install DLLs and do whatever else that let your dominant client go and talk to um, an antivirus and anti-spam and anti-phishing device. There's nothing out there. There's nothing there that gives your users the ability to, you know, what has my AV, my anti-spam done for me lately? There's nothing there. Um, that's built into the dominant client. Usually it's going to some website of some kind, a web page that lets you set things for yourself. But I, I know a lot of devices have that, but many places don't set it up. This is pretty um, this is pretty, pretty seamless, and it is extremely easy to implement. Um, the, only, the only thing that you have um, as a must is that you're going to need a notes client that's uh, 851 or newer. And the um, mail file design has to be 851 or newer. That's the only, that's the only um, uh, requirement you have. If you have that, you can set this up without a problem. And it's pretty seamless. And we'll go through how to do that right here. OK. Um, the documentation actually has, if you go through the documentation later, it's, it's literally, it's, it's only two pages of what you need to do. Um, I like to do it in this order, but that's just me. Um, initially, the first thing I always like to do is just to say, well, um, set up LDAP. You need to tell the Lotus protector. For protector to work and to be able to recognize who's coming in, it needs to have a directory to authenticate against. And normally, in most cases, that would probably be your domino directory. Uh, and there's some, if you go into here and you look at um, policy objects and then go to directory, there's uh, there's by default four settings in there that you can use and then um, work with. There's two for Active Directory, two for um, uh, the Domino Directory. Pick the one for um, online, go in there, um, make it active and edit it, and put in the details for your directory, like the DNS name, IP address, and which port, and what your uh, and what your basic schema is. And let's click Save, and now. Um, your protector will be able to look up names and say, well, who are you and authenticate your users. Pretty simple. Um, the next thing you have to do is you have to now tell protector to actually allow users to go in and interact with it. By default, it's turned off. So there's another setting. You just go into policy. There's an end user interface. You change that to granted instead of uh, which is denied originally. Uh, you just look if the end user interface URL actually fits what you need. It's going to have the port 4443, which is default. You set that, click Save Settings, done. That's your next step. The next thing you have to set is you have to actually allow the internal firewall of Lotus Protector um, to let the port 4443 go through. And uh, there's a firewall setting in there. You go in, you say end user access. Um, port by default is 443. Do you want it? Which port do you want it to use? Normally, it would probably be your um, ETH1 port, which is the default port. Um, again, you just click Save. That part is done. And the last part that you have is you have to tell your Lotus, uh, your Lotus Notes client um, that there's a protector here now that you can interact with. And there are several ways of doing this. Um, either you can do it through a desktop policy. And what it needs is the, no the notes client needs a notes any variable. And the any variable is called dollar sign protector underscore location equals. And then either the DNS name with the port or the IP address with the port. 
And uh, you can do that, like I said, either through a desktop policy, which is pretty easy, or if you have some kind of software that runs in your environment that updates files, like I don't know, like SMS or, or, or Microsoft from a software service, or anything else, or in, in the simplest way, if you, if you have problems with policies or have nothing else, you could send users a button and have that added to their no cleaning file. And that's really all it means. It does not require a restart of your client, though so you'll have to shut, close down the, the mail um, if you have it open. Um, and uh, right after that, you're going to start to see all of these things pop up here. Uh, this is the um, um, the temp. This is not the default Lotus Notes template that you get for 851. This is my template. I use a slightly modified one. So if you later on go and look at these slides and you see the top here, it's going to look a little different than what you might be used to. But what um, but what that shows you that if you do not modify, even if you've modified your template somewhat, you're still going to get the spam protection parts down here. They're going to pop up. They're going to be visible. And there's some uh, there's going to be some extra buttons here on the top that will um, allow you to um, highlight a mail and and, uh, and flag it as spam so that the protector gets updated and can keep that spam from happening in the future. So even if you have specified, um, you know, changed non-stock um, Lotus Notes mail file templates, it'll still work as long as the base that you use is 8.5.1 or newer because all of that stuff that it needs is an 8.5.1 and it works like a charm right after that. Uh, if once you, um, these little screens here with the log on, what it shows you is um, once you click on, uh, on your spam protection, what it is because you want to look at it, basically what you're doing is you're logging in to the, um, to the web server or port 4443 on the uh, Lotus Protector device. So it's going to ask you for your username and password. And it's going to also ask you to um, accept the certificate. So once you do that, you're going to have everything possible. This is um, that button I had mentioned before. Like I said, my template looks very different, but that button still made it in there. And I can highlight anything I want and consider it and flag it as spam. It is this simple. Really nothing to it. Very easy to do and very powerful. I think the most important part you're going to have here is, is actually a little bit of training information to your users because if this suddenly pops up on their screen, they either won't notice it first or not know what to do with it. But uh, it's, I, I like it a lot, and this interaction for the end user is what I think is the, is the most powerful part of this whole device, in, in my opinion, because it, it changes the, uh, the ownership of spam and, uh, and of antivirus to the user and takes it, makes your life a little bit easier. Okay, um, this is the end of what I wanted to talk about. Um, this is some information where you can find some more documentation or resources on Lowe's Protector for Mail Security. They have, there's a pretty good wiki. There's a home page, of course, on the IBM uh, website. Um, there's, there's a link to the actual documentation. There are several um, PDF files you can download. None of them are very large. Um, that's another thing I like. The document, when you print it out, is not 522 pages that you now have to labor through. Uh, it's really, I think it's like 90-something pages. It's very simple. And then there's also a support form that is surprisingly unbusy uh, because, and most of the questions in there are more of a how-to nature, less of a, oh, there's a bug problem. So you'll probably find some of those. And uh, that's more or less it. It's from start to finish. If you, we'd have timed it, we've actually been working on that, we probably would have been done with all of this within two hours maybe two and a half if we're slow and we drink more coffee than we should and we have to go to the restroom in between. But that's it. This is how fast you can implement a very safe and secure um, device in your environment. And I've actually had some, um, some, some conversations with um, uh, IBM about this, about how safe and how this really works. Like all the other big um, antivirus and anti-spam providers in the world, they have their websites, they have their data centers all over the world that capture information from different devices and that capture mail and they update, they guarantee you at least the same, if not better, antivirus and anti-spam performance than, any, than all of the other big providers out there. And what I did in my environment initially, I put in uh, Lotus Protector um, in the first line and after that I had what I had been using for my, uh, for my own antivirus and anti-spam after it and I ran it for three months. 
the full 90 days. And I have to say, I get a lot of spam. Um, because of my first name, for some reason, I get a lot of Russian spam, uh, which I cannot read. However, none of it made it through the first line of defense. I, or maybe there was one, but that was it. So I can give this my full vote of confidence. And uh, now I'm open for any questions that you might have. There, I'll, I'll unmute myself real quick. There we go. No, let's see if we – we didn't have any during the session, which is excellent. But where's your contact information? Where can they find you, by the way, Victor, before we – Right here. That was easy. It's, it, yeah, that's easy. Um, I'm, it's, it's, I'm Victor all over the place, and uh, I didn't – Chris is I don't know if I'm Victor all over the place. Um, so email victor at solstice.com. It's the easiest way to reach me because uh, I have a BlackBerry, and I look at it all the time. Uh, if you want to get me on Skype, I'm on there on occasion. And if you see me online, go ahead. You can, um, all I'll do is ignore you if I don't have any time. Twitter, I don't tweet that much, but I do off and on. And it is a way to reach me because, again, my BlackBerry will tell me that someone tweeted me directly. Uh, information about me, you can find at my uh, company website. And I do blog. Not much this last week and a half because I had to prepare this uh, webinar. But other than that, I try to blog on a regular basis. and. Uh, I'm happy to hear from anyone who wants to either ask me questions or uh, or prove me wrong at any time, which many people do at times. All right. There's a couple things I want to touch on before everyone got out early in terms of some of the things you presented that were, were key. Is One, the 90-day trial. Everyone needs to understand it's a fully functional 90-day eval. They're not limiting anything. You can put it in play. You can you know get the VM and go with it. A lot of people don't understand that that 90-day trial is available to them which is a major selling point for any of the products across the Lotus suite, but mainly if you're trying to prove it in your architecture. Um, the second part is you can, uh, in a way, piecemeal deploy this, uh, what we've done in some betas, like you showed the integration to the mail file, you know, through the notes any variable. Uh, so you can just give it to a select number of users and route certain users through. We didn't, you didn't talk about that in the config, but you're allowed to specify a certain group to be filtered and let the rest pass through. Uh, to your existing environment. We've done that at some locations as a beta as well. So Protector actually handles all the inbound requests, but it's only filtering for some people, and the rest goes to their existing appliances. So the users really don't know it's there, uh, if you haven't done it that way. And then the integration on the left side, you touched on it. Are you finding users, I asked Victor, that yes. people are liking the integration into the mail file natively on that left navigator bar better than the other products so far? Uh, it's a mixed bag. Uh, I think it really depends on how intensively do people use Lotus Notes or not. How users usually like it. Um, people that receive an exorbitant amount of mail, they start liking it once. Um, once the first time they call the help and say, "I'm waiting for mail to come. I know someone sent it to me. I don't know where it is." Um, many people don't notice it right away, depending on the screen resolution. But once the help desk tells them, "Hey, you can look for everything that was held or somehow worked for you right here." and it'll tell you if you're missing something or what we caught for you, that's when they start really liking it. Right. So high volume users then start adapting it and, and, and really looking for it. And then, then they start hounding the help desk with why is this being held. And then what about VM versus physical deployments? I'm thinking everything we're seeing right now is, is mainly towards the VM stream. Yes. Well, the, the only difference here is, um, and the link for the actual um, uh, configuration shows it to you. There's a difference in how much volume a VM session, uh, you know, a VM instance can do, and a full-fledged hardware appliance can do. That's the only difference. Um, of course, a VM, because it's, it's it's virtual, cannot deal with the same amount of volume. However, it's really flexible, and most environments that I run into have some sort of um, of a virtual environment in their DMD or maybe in their hot backup site. So for that, it's ideal. If you have a very, very high volume place, I would always rather go with, with an appliance if right now you use IBM hardware especially. Otherwise, if uh, you think you get more mail than a, than a single VM can do, well, guess what? You cluster it. And there you go. So I, personally, I love the, the ability to do VM because it makes it so easy, especially if you, all you want to do is test it. Exactly. Like you showed that because it's MX records, everyone needs to understand it's just DNS for the Internet. You can put these things anywhere. So you can put them in yeah. across both your DR sites. You can 
put all of them in one place if you wanted to, not best recommendation. You could put them across the globe. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Users aren't going to see that part of it. Now, connectivity, you made one good point. If you have one single protector server, they're going to connect to that. But if you have multiple, the placement of your central server for administration is a key thing because users look to that for configuration, right? Yeah, and that's where they'll get their information. It, it basically the, the, the cluster mates and the central appliance talk to each other. And it's not like in Domino where all the cluster mates have exactly the same information. Um, the, in essence, a mail that came in that was held by a cluster mate is not being transferred to the central appliance. That cluster mate actually holds it, but it tells the central appliance, what did I do and what am I holding? And that information is what then the central appliance displays to the end user. And okay. when the end user then says, do something this, do that, release it or not, the central appliance then tells that cluster mate, I want you to do this with that mail, and then the action actually happens. Excellent. Well, sir, we don't have any other questions that came through that I can see. Let me double check, make sure there's nothing new. Nope, nothing else new. Don't think so. Nope, nothing nope. else new. So everybody, uh, so you know, you can reach Victor online, uh, tulsus.com for his company, notesbusters.com for his actual blog that he writes. Semi well, you were semi-regular. You're, you're regular enough. Uh, yeah, fairly. <laughs> Twitter, not so much, but he's regular enough on uh, his blog and the content there. You can find him there. Yeah. Uh, also, look for some upcoming Consult in Your Pocket webinars. We actually had some requests, so that's to everybody that's listening in. If you have requests for topics that you want covered that we do not have on the schedule, uh, please let us know. Otherwise, all of the replays are available. It is now subscribable through your iTunes client as well. The link is on the page itself for Consult in Your Pocket, so you can actually grab as soon as a new one is released. You'll be able to grab that type of feed coming from there. Uh, you'll get the full video and replay, everything involved. And the wiki and documentation pages are in the slides themselves, which will be available, but you can see them here on the page as well. Um, I think, like you said, the support forum is a little bit light right now. Not a lot of people yes. answering questions yet. Uh, no, the wiki not, is growing. Not, not many. Yeah, I mean, because it's just, you know, this is starting to grow, but everyone needs to understand this isn't a product that Lotus built a couple of years ago and just uh, laid out the door. Uh, protectors based on technology that's been around for years, a uh, company yeah. that they absorbed a while ago and as soon as you turn it on the hit rate is pretty pretty staggering in the amount of stuff that it stops right out of the box. Yes, I was very surprised. I was very surprised, really. I mean, first I didn't trust it, but it it was surprising. I got nothing through. You know what we've had have had is some uh side questions I've had answered directly from Lotus themselves. One about keyword filtering right now, it's a global filter not a per user basis. Uh, for the yeah. keyword stuff. Another about uh, the look and feel and some documentation on that. We actually modified the CSS in the mail file to give it the look and feel of the notes mailbox, meaning, you know, red versus unread, because uh, it is it is an embedded web browser, basically, when you're clicking to see your spam filter uh, for, you know, as an individual, as a, as a user in a mail file. So we've modified the CSS to give it a look and feel a little closer to notes of red and unread, things like that. Uh, so you yeah. have some flexibility that you can do. Well, which I, I mean, I must admit that I would have never tried that, but I'm going to plagiarize your work there, and, you know, as soon as I can, yeah. because I find that is a really great way of working. I mean, it's because if you can really make it look like it's part of the notes client, people will like it even more. Exactly. When they go in and see what's, you know, it doesn't have the stars, well, you could technically with the CSS, uh, but it doesn't have the stars and everything as you would see in an inbox, but you can make it the, the colors, the bold, the red, the click, the under, you can do whatever you want to do to make it look more like, the mailbox, which is what we did, we made it the uh, darker bold, and then when you have read that message, it then releases it. Now, keep it in mind, it is an embedded browser, so when you carry across to another machine, uh, there is a problem with seeing which links you've clicked on because it's storing in that local client's cache of what's been Correct, clicked, yeah. not clicked. But you know, yeah. for a user that works at his desktop or laptop all the time, it's it's very sufficient uh, in regards to that. And it's easy to add and remove things from the list themselves. So, well, it looks like we're going to give everybody back about 15 minutes of time today. So if there's other questions, yeah. please email Victor, uh, email events at consultantinyourpocket.com, uh, email Victor at tolsis.com, and otherwise yep. everybody, that is another one. Victor, thank you for your time this morning. Well, thank you for having me. And everyone, that is another episode. I don't need to put up any other slides because uh, he did it all for us. So we'll see you uh, actually in a couple weeks for the next one.
Oh, thanks a lot. Goodbye. All right.